So if you've learned already a lot of 3D data science tech, here let's put that all in play in a complete system with my ultimate point cloud processing stack that I use every day. This is part of my activities as a consultant for 1,500 companies or when I teach uh, students and professionals at the academy to achieve their goal, especially to create innovative products. So as you can see, we have 10 major steps, the 10 easier, and I will detail what is happening in each one of them. The first layer is something that we may bypass is the data acquisition and understanding. Before processing comes actually understanding what you have. And this is fundamental and we often bypass that. So it's very important. And usually the question that I ask you is why do your sensor knowledge matters more than your algorithm? Because if that fails, the complete pipeline may fail as well. So this is very important to pinpoint that. As an example, I saw um, for this lens surveying company, they were using terrestrial laser scanner from a specific brand and they had the complete pipeline based onto a mobile laser scanning um, component suite that was uh, adjusting to the tra having trajectory as input, for example, having not colors, uh, especially a wrong pixel mapping on it. So it was completely wrong only because this uh, specific layer was not well put in place. So that's the first stage. So with data understood, what is the next logical step? And this is the bucket two, which I will call EO. So we want to get data in and out reliably. And what you need to ensure, and that relates to a previous uh, um, system that I shared, is that make sure that you work agnostic of anything, if you can, and work with structured components. Let me give you an example. If from this bucket EO, you pass to the third bucket, which I will explain just uh, later, a PL wire file, then this will expect a PL wire. And then afterward, you need to switch um, the format. So it means you need to go back there and re-inject something for the next. This is really cumbersome. So you need to work at an abstract level, especially, uh, and also having this computation consideration in mind, where what is out of that will be an object in your, uh, let's say, programming kind of um, way. And this is very important so that you can abstract the layer of the input and output, okay? So now that you have something clean, we go into the next bucket, which is um, filtering. Cleaning. If we abstract a bit higher what we have here, we can call that pre-processing. And this is something that will happen always in your um, data processing for point clouds. You need to ensure that this is super efficient and super key because all the other components usually rely on that. So if I had to put a specific order, already at this stage, we have data acquisition understanding, and we go there. And from there, we'll go always often to this preparation part. So that also encompasses styling, uh, preparation strategies, and so on. What's happening after? This is not always the case, but this is something that usually is useful, especially if we work with multimodal data is all that is linked with what I would call registration. So in the registration bucket, we usually have one or more scans, one or more point cloud, one or more data modalities. And the goal here is how can we bring that all into the same system where everything is tied in, everything is locked in place so that if we made a change on something, the other one is impacted, or if we want to work with everything at once, we can without issues where we have uh, double skins, where we have problem of accuracy, and we are being something not reliable. So this is very important. So what is next? And what is next is the most central part. This is not for nothing that I put it here. And this is super key. This is what I will call feature extraction. So how do we turn point in space into something that is more refined? And we have so many things going up under this bucket, which makes it very central because you can actually, and I will give you an example right away, use feature extraction for filtering, for registration, for all those other parts, okay? So this is something that is absolutely central. And also here, this, is because of the property. Essentially, what we have is XYZ, the base geometry, and you may have a bunch of attributes. But with feature extraction, we aim to go into a latent space, so some kind of embedding where we can represent whatever we will need as part of feature that will help any of these tasks. So for EO, it will be maybe for a point 
if it's uh, useful or not, so that in the loading, maybe we load it at the end. For the filtering, it could be, okay, we will filter based on planarity. Uh, for registration, okay, we will base it based on semantic classes. So all of that is derived from this uh, latent space or feature extraction stage. So this is the most central component, and this is very often overlooked by um, professionals. Why? Because this is a, it's not a direct value. It's uh, something that is core. If you build it properly, you will see your return on investment uh, tripled, tenfold, 100-fold if this is made really, really, really in a smart way. So double down on that. And even if you are working with very advanced uh, 3D deep learning techniques, or if you are working with, uh, let's say, special aware LLMs or AI in general, we often bypass this, and this is a more central stage. Okay, so what is the sixth bucket? Well, this is the modeling bucket, modeling. And in here, we'll find all and any task associated with converting some kind of discrete data representation into a model uh, that could be used for simulation. So the first object that popped to my mind is the mesh, the 3D mesh, okay? So this is part of the modeling. But also, if you are in the construction industry, you may model into a BIM, um, building information model, your point cloud, or a flow plan, or even uh, modeling uh, with voxels, modeling with uh, B-reps, modeling with any kind of representation that makes sense to you. By the way, this is a short discretion to say that I have all of this and more into the book that I uh, wrote, which is called a 3D Data Sense with Python Building Accurate Digital Environment with 3D Point Cloud Workflow. So this is a uh, 690 pages. I had more than three years to write it, but it's based on all my 15 plus years of expertise. You have um, also the code which is in it. So this is maybe the most complex project that I've ever done. And this is after having written a, a PhD thesis and, and numerous reports, but this was super complex. Hopefully you like it. Uh, you can find it anywhere. This is the best that I can do compacting all my knowledge into a very, very thorough book. Nevertheless, so Going after the sixth bucket, we can move on to the second stage, which is maybe the one that I prefer, which is the segmentation bucket. So we want to break the point into coherent region that makes sense. But what's the difference between segmentation and classification that we often hear? And that's what I have here. Classification will be part of the bucket classification eight, where segmentation bucket seven. What I mean here is pure segmentation and clustering. So trying to group um, your entire data set into manageable regions that make sense for any and all steps, which can also be visualization or modeling because you, you do part-based modeling. So this is central. Usually this will have algorithms like a region growing, a RENSAC for segmentation, but you can also RENSAC for modeling. Um, if you have unsupervised schemes, uh, DB scan, k-means, all these kind of things will fall here. Whereas in classification, we are much closer to having this rule-based system that will say, okay, this specific region that has all this point, this is part of a wall, or this is part of the scene. So it means you attach to any or all segments a concept that is uh, linked with a class. So this is what we have essentially. Today, these are absolutely central, okay? Um, and this is why in the 3D Geodata Academy, I have specific tracks, the segment OS that is heavily focused on all of that, right? Plus, of course, how to create the pipeline and that. And the 3D deep learning that showcases how you extend whatever we, we have as a result here into something with uh, supervised learning and 3D deep learning where we can push the metrics much, much deeper. But of course, all of that is uh, cutting edge. So this is the, <laughs> the hardest stuff that you can find today, especially if you are in any field where you didn't have a lot of computer vision or computer graphics experience before. This is very advanced, but this allows you to have a competitive edge that cannot be beaten uh, because the, the threshold to get there to this level is very high. So there is a lot of people discouraged to get there. But if you if you have the strength and the willpower, uh, this, this is fantastic what you can do with that. All right, so discretion apart. Now we move on to the ninth bucket. Um, which is the decision-making. And this is where the fun begins. Because in the decision-making bucket, essentially, we want to leverage all that we have before to augment the capacity of our decision-making agent. So this is mostly linked with AI and spatial agents. So if you can make it so that any 
of the deliverable that you have for your clients is uh, found automatically and also with extra expert insight based on your expert knowledge. And this is the specific buckets that should take care of that. If you have that part of your pipeline, uh, you are 10 steps ahead of the competition that you may have or you may want to have. And the last and final uh, little stage that I have here is the visualization. So usually, especially with point cloud and 3D data, it's super key to have a visual uh, component at each and every stage. And for the deliverables, this should be always part of it. This is something that we don't always do, but it's nice because it's not a lot of extra um, manpower to create a visual support to whichever deliverables you have for your clients. Right? So these are my 10 major components. And I want to talk a bit about what is here. So the data flow architecture. So each bucket passes standardized data to the next bucket. This is the starting point. But why should bucket three never care about the file format from the bucket two? And this is what I explained before. Uh, if you work with standardized data, it's much easier to have something much like a pipeline that is able to handle any failure cases because it's very robust. So data flows cleanly. What about performances? And this is the computational consideration that we should have in mind. Most if you can, of us will always want to go straight to our GPU because this is the most compute power that you have uh, currently for all the task vision related. But its uh, consumption energy level is very high and of course the cost associated with the hardware and also the infrastructure is much higher. So if you can optimize almost all for CPU only and you do use the GPU for training steps only, uh, in the classification or decision-making scenarios. And whenever you do pure inference, usually we can leverage only uh, CPU. This is if you don't do real-time application. If you do real-time application, we will have two layers. One which is thinking about the way we code. Is Python the most efficient way to do that? Or if it's something else? And the second layer is, okay, maybe we need to leverage this GPU. And the last thing is the production deployment model. Um, what is the way that I recommend to do? How can you move away from getting stuck into a prototype where you have a, just a Jupyter notebook, for example, where the, the answer is really about having this flow where you prototype in Jupyter, you export some kind of something, and in Jupyter, you test all the stages. This is super key. You test that everything works with a visual component. And once that is done, you refactor your code so that it's super lean, super efficient, and super modula modulable, if that's a word. And then after, you will push that to, a, for example, a Docker container, where on upload, you will have a trigger that will also uh, launch everything, log what you have, and once the process is finished, send an email to say, okay, the process is finished, here is your results. So that's an idea, that's how I encourage and how I put in place things in uh, the various companies that um, I follow, for some of them, from some of them it's much more complicated, but here you have uh, an idea about how to proceed from there so that you don't have something that stay on a virtual shelf and that is not very usable. All right, I think that's good enough for um, today. Hopefully you got a lot of value from that. If you are not subscribed already, please do so by just clicking subscribe below and don't hesitate to drop a comment about what you would like to see next or what you didn't understood very clearly and I will do my best to answer um, as soon as possible. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.